a report on. Uh, yes, we have a report from uh, from Nathan on uh, on his uh, presentation at the um, science fair, and we also have a report from our co-winner. Um, I'm terribly sorry, the name has just slipped my mind right now, talking about the uh, uh, studying uh, uh, Jupiter with a uh, dipole uh, homemade uh, radio astronomy uh, uh, setup. Sorry, well, I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around, around that. And we probably also have a few people, at least with uh, images or observing reports, So, uh, as well as, um, as uh, Laurie's uh, report about the uh, progress on astronomy day. So. Um, Laurie, actually, why don't you begin and uh, tell us how well the Astronomy Day events went. Oh, I would rather give the floor over to Evan. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's already, he's already, he's going to be way better than I ever will be. So, oh, okay. so yeah. And I guess, and Nathan, Nathan, I, I, you're not feeling terribly well today and you're going to do it another week, right? Oh dear, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I think so. Sorry. Okay. But I, I'm okay. happy to listen to uh I'm looking forward to listen to Evan's talk. <laughs> okay. All right. My, go, my go Evan. My apologies, Evan. I was working without notes here, so I was that's all good. Sorry. No worries. Okay, so share my screen. This will work. Okay. Is this good, I think? Um, I'm gonna keep this kind of like pretty low key. Uh, I've done this presentation like many times now over the course of science fair and my capstone project. Um, so I'll start with kind of why I chose to do this project. It started back last year in grade 11. Um, I had to decide what I was gonna do as my capstone project to graduate high school. And at the time, of course, I was really into astronomy and I was wondering what I could do with that sort of put my own spin on it, um, maybe build my own telescope. Uh, but then I started looking into radio astronomy, um, which is not something I thought was actually feasible for someone to do like amateur kind of. Um, I thought it was just like something that they have huge radar dishes for, you know, in special locations. But it turns out there's actually a lot of materials online for people like me interested in doing amateur radio astronomy projects. And so I immediately reached out to my uncle because he is a physics prof at McGill and he does a lot of ham radio stuff. And so he got me my first SDR dongle, so it's software defined radio. Um, and I got my own little rabbit ear antenna and I could hook it up to my computer and observe like radio spectrum just in Victoria, listen to the kind of local weather reports and stuff. So I thought that was really cool. Um, my original plan was to go with observing the hydrogen line that of course that takes a lot more uh, effort, lots more material, and I didn't have as many resources for that. So I landed on the Radio Jove project, which was actually suggested by Alex. Last year, I asked him if he had anything for me to do uh, looking into radio astronomy, and that was, and then, yeah, so he printed out um, the first iteration, I think, of the Radio Jove project, which I'll explain a bit later. Um, but I ended up going with that path, and over the course of this past winter, actually, I uh, built this radio telescope, and here are the results. So hopefully, that, okay, that's good. It's changed. My objective, of course, was to observe an Io-related Jovian radio storm uh, under conditions which rely on the positioning of Jupiter, Earth, and Io kind of relative to one another. And so there's some interesting theory and observations that have been made that have proven that Io, Jupiter's moon, actually plays this key role in um, these radio emissions that we can detect. And so I'll get into that again in the next slide. So this is where the theory kind of lies. Io, of course, is super close to Jupiter and it's super heavily influenced by Jupiter's intense gravitational field. So, and the other bodies, of course, orbiting Jupiter, it's being like ripped apart. And as a result, it's super volcanically active. And so every time they send spacecraft past it, they see just all these eruptions happening all the time. And so this massive amount of material is constantly being ejected into Io's atmosphere. And a small percentage of that actually escapes into space and becomes ionized. So then there are suddenly these free electrons that are spiraling around in Jupiter's magnetic field. And it creates what's called the Io torus, which is just like this band of electrons kind of orbiting around Jupiter in the path that Io takes. Um, 
And here, uh, there's this massive current that kind of gets uh, created between Jupiter and Io. And I think it reached up to like 6 million amps or something insane. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so actually, Randy, you asked me on email, like, what is causing this? Why does Io have to be in this exact position relative to Jupiter and the Earth? And I looked into it a lot. I tried to find some answers, but I could not find an answer as to why, only just explaining what has been observed from this. And I think that's something else with science. When you start asking why, it leads to a lot of other questions. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my life. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an image of the structure itself. Um, this I constructed, or I set it up and took it down many, many times over at Lansdowne Middle School because they have a super big open field, um, which I thought was like perfect for observing. Yes, it's in the middle of the city, but um, I did my best to kind of rule out some interference, stayed away from power lines, um, any big sources of metal, um, and my Wi-Fi didn't cause too much of a problem because Wi-Fi is much higher frequency. Um, and of course, the frequency that I was observing at was around the 20 megahertz frequency. Um, and I'll show you too on the spectrogram later. But this telescope or this antenna structure, I should say, it's um, two dipole antennas. So dipole is just the type of antenna looking at this polarized radiation. Um, and so they're oriented uh, east-west sort of. So I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but this is on the um, east side, these two posts here, and then these posts are on the west side. And then of course it's north and south in this direction. Um, so that's sort of the orientation and that's super important because the telescope, it's not, I mean, it's not a telescope that you look at through your eye, of course, but it is still looking at the sky at a certain region of the sky. And so based off of the frequency that I was looking at, um, of course, corresponding to the wavelength of the radio emissions, I had to build the telescope all around this. So I worked with um, imperial measurements because I was just using a lot of hardware store construction materials. So it made more sense for me to do that. But I got the original wavelengths of around 20 megahertz. Um, don't remember that is. It's about 50 feet. <laughs> um, you can do the conversion yourself. Uh, so the sides along here you can see and I have a model too that I can show you in a second so right here this is copper wire and that has been cut to exactly one half of the wavelength so uh, each section here this is about 12 13 feet so in total it's about 25 26 feet um, there is a bit of a large error on that because it doesn't have to be too too precise luckily because I'm not looking at one very specific frequency um, so that goes for both dipoles here and the posts that you see here, these are PVC pipes. They're like one and a quarter inch in diameter. So super flimsy. Um, oh, yeah. Thank so you. So what I can do is I can take this and you can unshare the screen. OK. Um, do that. Should I come up? Oh, no, well, and then um, it's OK. I've got, I've got a recording in front of it. Is it working? OK, so. I guess we'll go like that. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Hopefully things don't fall off. So this is a little model that I made kind of to demonstrate and replicate um, <laughs> what it is I built, of course, because the structure is huge in real life. Um, so this is exactly 140th the size of the actual structure. Um, so here are the 10 foot PVC pipes and the copper wire goes across here. And coming down from the copper wire, you can almost see it. It's super small in this model, but these are supposed to be representing the coaxial cable, cables that are coming down from both dipoles here. And these are cut to uh, one wavelength times the velocity factor, which is about 66% um, the speed of light in vacuum, um, which needs to be counted for because I was using a certain kind of coaxial cable. And I used to have a little kind of compass here that would show northeast, southwest, but I don't have that anymore. So you just have to take my word for it. This is the northern dipole, and this is the southern dipole. And the southern dipole, I had to account for, of course, we are super high up latitude-wise um, on Earth. So Jupiter is certainly not right above us in the sky. So in order to kind of shift the phasing of the antenna, I added this phasing cable in, um, which kind of goes, yeah, really hard to see it, but it goes from this blue thing right here 
to uh, the power combiner right here. So that's an extra you know, one quarter wavelength um, with the velocity factor, of course, being found for. And then there's a fourth coax so cable that goes from the power combiner to the RSP or the radio spectrum processor, which I have right here. So it just kind of looks like this. And this is what's doing all of the um, kind of processing the signal and turning it into something I can just plug into my computer with USB ports here. I'll just plug it in right here. And. Hey, Evan. Uh -huh. Is it just the center of the coaxial cable that you're attaching? Um, and what does the ground get grounded to? Uh, I don't, sorry, I don't know what you mean. So the coaxial right. cable mm -hmm. is, there's a conductor up the middle. Yeah. And then there is a, there's a shield, shield yeah. that goes around it. So what is attached to what? Okay, so there's this piece here. This actually plugs in like right onto the coaxial cable right here. Just a little, a little plugged in with the inner wire there. And then um, on the model, oh yeah, here's a picture of my You're model. You're not sharing yet. Oh, whoops. Okay, hang on. Go back. And show. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, it's just a bit delayed. So, these spots right here, uh, kind of hard to see. So here and actually here and here, and same on the other side, there are insulators there um, to make sure there's no kind of uh, current flowing outside. And then there are also some little ferrite toroids right here along the coaxial. So no currents flowing outside of the cable. But right here, there's a connection. Um, so here is soldered to the copper wire. Um, so because each of these sections are one quarter wavelength, this just connects to the insulator and doesn't actually connect to the other wire here. Um, so I split the coaxial into kind of two uh, segments and then wrapped it around the copper wire and then soldered it on there. Uh, these connections actually broke a couple times. So that had to be fixed. Um, didn't realize they were broken until we were observing and it was like, this is not looking right. Um, and of course, yes, I had my friend here helping me set this all up because the whole thing setting it up is just a huge job in itself it takes like 25 minutes um tying down all the guy lines so these are just ropes tied down with some tent pegs um so does that sort of answer your question randy well the specific one is that both sides of the <laughs> dipole do they come to the single um Black conductor uh, or does one go to the center and one go to the outside so uh of the copper wire yeah so yeah, yeah, the actual antenna part. Um, so this comes to an insulator, and then the other one also comes to an insulator. So they're just ceramic insulators. So that no, what happens in the middle? Oh yeah, so it's just one insulator right here and right here. Um, so the copper wire is attached to that, and then the coaxial comes up like this, and then so I I cut it like cut the wire back, and then so I have the actual inside wire sticking out split it into two pieces and then just tied it around each individual okay. copper wire. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So that, that work that helps. Uh, okay. Hopefully it's a bit easier to understand. Okay. Although um, I hope the ham operators in the crowd here are going to. <laughs> so you feel free to, yeah, give me so feedback. You take, so me you take it down to the box and then the box is grounded. So the shield is grounded on the coax. Um, the, this thing, yeah. the receiver. Yeah, so this is just attached here to, like, after the coax is combined, the power combiner, another coax comes from there to connect into here, and this connects into the computer. So is the shield's not attached to anything? Um, no. It's floating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so there's just another picture of the model, and this is a, an aerial shot, so my friend had a drone, he flew it around and tried to get some photos. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of trying to put it into perspective, us in the corner over here, and then the structures here, it's fish-eyed lens, but yeah. So this is what I'm actually looking at on the computer uh, as the signal comes in. So this is the first program that I use. This is called SDR console. So this just kind of gives me the waterfall spectrum right here. Um, and this I can adjust, fine tune all of these little bits. Oh. Um, so up here, there's like uh, gain changes and then bandwidth. So I was setting it to 16 megahertz, 24 megahertz down here. 
um, you can change shit right here too. So I was looking at 20.1 megahertz because that's just the frequency that I used to do the calculations for the antenna. Um, so this is interesting, but this is a bit more interesting. Um, so right here, this software actually predicts when IO is going to be in the best place and when is the best time to observe. So right here, this is a plot of the CML of Jupiter, the central meridian longitude, which is um, basically just how Jupiter is split into a series of coordinates, just like on Earth, we have the prime meridian. Um, so this is plotting all the way 360 degrees. Um, because this actually does also play a role in these radio emissions, um, but less so than IO's position. Um, because, yeah, so IO is known to play like a way bigger role. Um, so this is why I was kind of going for an IO based observation instead of like something going off of the um, central meridian longitude. Um, so this is plotted here on the x axis, and on the y axis, I have the IO phase which is a measure of, um, going back to this, measure of Io's position in its orbit around Jupiter. So an Io phase of zero degrees is right here, and then goes 90, um, 180, and then 270. So it, right here and here, kind of perpendicular to Jupiter and the Earth, that's where it's like prime time for observation. Um, just going back here. This is another tab I had open just showing where Jupiter was in the sky at the time. So it was just a couple hours away from setting. And this is the spectrograph program, which I was actually getting all my data from. This is what I was showing on my science fair project board. And so this is a plot of time versus frequency. Um, so this time is just measuring in UTC. So How long is the horizontal yeah so this is one minute right here. one minute so yeah so this is 2 a.m uh utc seven minutes and six minutes um so each segment yeah it's about is 10 seconds so what you can see here these vertical lines these are the s bursts short bursts of the iob uh radio storm that i was observing which you can see of course in the um detection probability over here so these are super short bursts, uh, just like even a couple milliseconds coming in. Um, so this is what I was super interested in seeing. I was super excited, of course, when I finally saw these coming up. It had taken many, many tries to finally get some uh, signals. So the horizontal lines, these are all uh, just local interference. And this diagonal line here, this is kind of interesting. This is called a chirp, which is, um, I think it's just uh, from a radar sweep, so local yeah. radar. Um, and down below, this is cut off here, but this is just a, a wider plot of what I was looking at. So this is over the course of like 10 minutes. Um, so here is another image of the data. This is a pretty good burst right here. Um, this is right around two hours and 30 minutes past midnight. And here's another image. Um, so there's another chirp right there. Um, I could have observed maybe a bit further up in the spectrum not really lower down because these signals aren't typically seen around there, around that uh, lower frequency, but um, usually between 10 megahertz and 40 megahertz are the decimetric uh, radio, radio <laughs> emissions. Um, not usually seen above 40 megahertz and not really sure why. Um, I've tried to research that, but it seems that other people do not know why either. So, so Evan, you, you saw these lines mm -hmm. um, as per predicted by your plan, right? Yeah. Um, what does the rest of the field look like when it's not near those times? Yeah, that's so. Like, what does a spectrogram yeah. kind of look like? Yeah, that's a good good question. Otherwise, I, how do we know this? Yeah, way? of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you just unfortunately you just have to take my word for it right now. <laughs> um, I really should have taken some images. I could have actually just gone on the program. Well, I wasn't. I didn't have the antenna set up, and I could have just taken some images. It looks like this without the vertical lines, but that doesn't tell you much, obviously, because mm -hmm. I'm telling you that the vertical lines are And, and what, seen, what, what but... is the cadence for seeing these lines? Like when would the next lines appear? Yeah, so it's it's sporadic. It's like not fully, like it can't just predict it usually. So it's just, it updates every 10 seconds and um, I'll see like maybe a couple lines here. Some might be a bit brighter. Some might be a bit fainter. Um, but it's just sort of whatever comes in. Um, so they don't come in at a specified time? No. 
Okay. It's yeah, it's random. So your planning was just for like a good. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So going back to here. Um, so the darker red, this is showing higher probability. So this shows probability over here too. You can see it's at 90%. Um, whereas over here in the blue, it goes down to like five or 10%. Um, so it's not like 0% that you can't observe anything, but it's unlikely that it would be an IO radio, IO related radio storm. If it, yeah, so what I'm curious about is in the non red area or in the low probability area, mm -hmm. uh, do you have an absence of lines? Yes. Yeah. An absence of vertical lines yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the first couple of times I was setting it up, I was just going off of what time I had. So I wasn't like, I didn't um, base the whole observing session around what was predicted for that day. It was maybe off in the blue, like over here. So I wasn't going to see anything, but once everything was figured out and I had everything kind of configured and I knew I could bring it and just set everything up and try to observe. Then I started planning using this software I could predict and then like the following or the, like the next couple of weeks, I could see when it would be a higher probability. Um, so I went for this day. This is back in February, February 21st. Um, and how long is that red zone? Yeah, so these are hours. This is 17, 18. This was local time. So this is um, 17 hours. So this is about one hour right here. So you have so hour like hour. one hour of high probability. Yeah, it's it's super, super short. And the next one would be how long? It's random, like it's not a uh, set time, every, like all the time, but when I was observing, it, it seemed to be every about one week or two, I'd have a windows. Week. Yeah. You had one hour every week. Yeah. So I was um, obviously rather concerned about actually collecting some data before uh, the end of the year and the school year and my project <laughs> needed to be finished and everything. So I was, yeah, but you're not for seven months, anything. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least you're not worried about yeah were you able to confirm any of these bursts from outside sources yes exactly so yeah i'm getting i'm gonna get there <laughs> oh that's going to be the last thing um so this is just the last visual slide i have but i can still talk about um sort of what i wrote in my discussion um the radio jove project they have an online forum where lots of other people doing this kind of project they can go on and discuss any sort of data that they found or any questions like for example i was on there an awful lot when i was trying to set everything up especially with configuring the software i had a lot of problems because i was running running windows 11 instead of windows 10 like everything is based around in the instructions so i was long email chains but everyone was super helpful which was really good and i got super quick responses but on this forum too a lot of people go and share their data. So they upload photos of the spectrograms that they get. So is there um, a formal process where everybody puts stuff into a repository? So you have a long standing archive? Yeah. So the forum itself is pretty informal. It's just like okay. people upload and be like, oh, I saw this at this time. Anyone else observe anything? Okay. But there is a set database. So you can go and upload Good. and you uh, like put under, say, it's an IOA, IOB, IOC storm. Um, you can just list that and then upload images of your data. Yeah. Um, so on this forum, I upload my data from that night and I was like, Did anyone else see anything? And I, I saw someone else had posted, they had actually observed an IOB storm or they observed what they thought had been an IOB storm and they wanted some confirmation. So I was like, oh, I also observed this at the same time as you. Um, so we connected over that. He was down in Mexico um, at the time. I think he's, he observes down in Mexico because yeah, there are people all over the world observing. Um, so that was kind of my converse confirmation. Um, does location matter? Location does not matter because um, people are building their telescopes kind of around whichever latitude they're at. Usually, um, of course, Jupiter has to be above the horizon. So people aren't going to observe when Jupiter's like below the horizon. So it is likely that if someone else was um, going to confirm my observations, they'd be kind of along you, the same longitude. Uh, the corrector for your longitude. Yes, yeah, the phasing cable, yeah. Okay, and the person in Mexico, did they see bursts around the same time or did you actually, were you able to correlate the Yeah, bursts? like the specific bursts? Yeah. I wasn't able to do that because he didn't upload many photos. He uploaded like one or two, I think, um, just that were in kind of same like 15 minutes that I was observing and they were looking like exactly what I was seeing. Um, but I wasn't able to line up the exact radio bursts. So that could also kind of be like a fault in the data. Like there could have been a chance that it was just a coincidence. 
And that's the other thing too, if because I'm going to go do this again for sure. Um, in the future, I'm going to try to like confirm with a lot of other people, hopefully, because um, I don't know, last time there weren't that many other people to confirm, um, which is super important for the future to actually get yeah, like be, legitimate. Be interesting to coordinate yes. A capture, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so that's um, some of the other things I do for this project. I definitely should have planned everything out like word for word beforehand. I was kind of winging it because I was again on that um, time pressure. Uh, so I had just like a rough sheet that I'd write down ideas or um, sort of like plans for this, the structure. Um, but in the future, I'd prefer to have like actually created the proper blueprints and everything for that. Um, and also recording everything that's going on like while I'm doing it. So all of the configuring software, like that was all just kind of over my head. I had to learn a lot that I was not expecting to. Um, and since I haven't been doing it consistently, like I've kind of forgotten about some of it. Um, so like I could probably figure out how to set up the software again. Um, but running into all those issues, like, yeah, it was, it was it, just, just a comment, uh, Evan, there, there possibly might be a way for you to, um, record the changes that you make to the software. There, okay. there, there's a lot of industry standard ways of taking a baseline piece of software and then through scripting. Mm -hmm. you make the changes that you want to make and that way it's always repeatable okay. so you could take advantage of it yeah i have not done any coding yet any coding classes so that's for university me to figure out right <laughs> um yeah <laughs> yeah someday someday i'll get there yeah i wish i could say that i coded to like all the software but it was all just <laughs> provided by other people doing this project and stuff so yeah um so that kind of wraps it up for me and my talking i would like to open the floor for discussion questions and if you get Should rid I, of your screen yeah. then people can see you better okay is that better Quick question for you uh evan the mm -hmm. uh, prediction software that you had there showed um uh there are times when the um uh, the storms were predicted how do those relate to that uh, 90 degree and uh, 270 degree position of Io? Is that, uh, are those the points in Io's orbit when you're most likely to have the radio emissions or uh, uh, is, is that specifically um, tied into something else? Yeah, so um, actually I'll share my screen again just to go back to that plot. Um, there we go yes. so yeah so you can see here so they started uh after they uh, actually these signals were originally like accidentally discovered back in like 1955 or something and so over the course of many years they started plotting um or they would record like when they'd see these signals and they would record um pin like they pinpoint places on jupiter's surface to start getting some data for its uh rotational period but then they found um, over the course of like a couple of years, this started kind of drifting. So then they realized their data was not actually accurate and that they had to kind of start going off of um, these radio bursts. And from these radio bursts, we actually have such a precise um, understanding of Jupiter's orbital period or rotational period. Um, so going back to this plot here, this is the 360 degrees of Jupiter's central meridian longitude so that's just um which part of which part of jupiter's surface um is facing us at the time but kind of hard to see here on the y-axis this is the io phase so you can see here at 90 degrees you have a pretty high probability of detection and then again up here at 270 degrees there's the ioa uh storm and ioc storm so the a b and c this is just listing um like how probable it is that you're going to detect something if Jupiter is in this spot at this time. Um, so the IOC, of course, being least probable and IOA being most probable. Um, looking at this, it seems as if IOA would be less probable than IOB, so I'm not really sure what's going on with that. I'm sure there's more data and reasoning behind that, but I do not understand yet. No, um, the, the IOA and the IOA, IOB, and C are those different types of uh, radio storms, their radio emissions, or are they, uh, is that just to separate the areas of prediction on the, on the graph here? Yeah, so it's just to separate kind of the areas. It's all it's all the same, uh, same frequency, same wavelength. Um, it would be the same setup for observing any of these storms. 
Um, but it's just different times that they'd be happening at. Yeah. So that's sort of so, Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are, are, are what you what's generating the uh, electric signal? Is that uh, lightning storms in Jupiter's atmosphere? Is that what it is? So it's um, a lot of sulfur compounds being ejected uh, by by volcanoes on Io, and then so some of this escapes into space and then becomes ionized, so it loses its electrons, and then these electrons are suddenly free, so they're spiraling spiraling around in Jupiter's magnetic field. Um, and like cyclotron emissions, so the NEPA particle accelerator. Um, and then this movement of these electrons. Oops. Is it cyclotron radiation we're seeing? Yes. Okay, so that explains. Wait, yeah, what you're asking about? That explains why when it's at 90 and 180, because mm. that's exactly what happens. Like if you go to the, the Saskatchewan cyclotron radiation facility, oh, yeah. they have they have the labs, the beam comes out always um, along the path of the, the ring. Okay. So you've got all of these, you know, rays coming off it. So if that is cyclotron radiation, mm -hmm. then when IO is at 90 and 180, well, when it's at 90, then it's sending a beam towards us. This doesn't explain at all when it's at 270, why it should be going yeah. away from us. Yeah. But if it's a bidirectional uh, bidirectional emission, then uh, it, it would be sending it, uh, you would be getting, say, for instance, the front side of the lobe at 90 degrees and the uh, the back side of the lobe at, um, at 270 degrees. How about okay, so that, that you've got positive and negative ions? And they're going opposite directions. Okay, so that makes sense too. Why these these storms kind of are different too. So at ninety degrees it would be like this, and then two seventy degrees would be sort of lower probability. So there must be something there. And why B is more intense? Maybe. Yeah. Well, okay. Why not something at zero degrees then? Because then it'd be off into yeah. wrong direction. Well, it'd be shooting it'd be different directions. Off. To have, you know, to not it'd, it'd be, be aimed away from us. Yeah. But it's only when. I was moving towards us or when it's moving away from us that they, they it's aimed at us the, the beam is aimed at us well if you have three lobes then you should have four hmm. oh i don't know about the I, what, what, what the a b c thing is yeah well a, a and c or when it's going away from us at the uh at 270 degrees right yeah where uh, B is uh, when it's coming towards, towards us. us. And that's why it's more powerful, it looks like. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm now learning stuff about my own project. This is good. <laughs> Does anybody in the crowd know about cyclotron radiation? I'd like to learn more. Anybody? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Evan, did you have to deal with uh, how did you deal with noise? I'm assuming there's noise in this signal. Yeah, so this like this little um, SDR play receiver thing that actually does help kind of mitigate. Kind as, of main cleans the signal. Yeah, yeah, it um, amplifies signal, reduces some of the noise, um, but it's just kind of to the best of its abilities. This one is like specific to the frequency that I was looking at too, um, which is why I didn't use my other little SDR dongle. Um, but yeah, that's kind of all I could do for noise mitigation. Yeah. But your radio can observe many frequencies at the same time. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. You can select the bandwidth. So this is just about eight megahertz. Um, yeah, that's what it's what was recommended. Yeah. I mean, the dipole links right you kind of reject a lot of it. Say it louder. Say it louder. I said but because you have the dipole lengths correct. Mm -hmm. you're going to be tuning to a fairly narrow frequency mm -hmm. but the nature of the yeah yeah it's yeah. resonant at 21 megahertz yeah. yeah so you're rejecting a lot of the stuff that's on the side so you won't be getting much noise right um if i could share the screen here i've got two pictures that uh, might clarify a little bit of a few of the questions that have been asked okay, one second i have two minutes screen for here This is a uh, diagram of the emission from a from a dipole. 
as you can see, it's got uh, the, the lobes, the two lobes that I was speaking of, uh, forward and uh, backward, so that uh, if, if this was an emission, say, from if IO were at the center here, then these lobes would be pointed towards us at the uh, 90 degree and 270 degree in the orbit. So that that could explain the um, uh, that pattern, the uh, 90 and 270. Now, for cyclotron emission, I'm not sure if that would be different uh, given, or if there would be a forward and a, and a reverse uh, difference, but there could quite easily be, and that could explain the, the difference between the uh, B and the C uh, side. Now, okay, is that picture coming through, the different picture now? Yeah. Okay, this is, uh, uh, Randy, I believe you were asking about the um, uh, center and the uh, shield connection to a dipole antenna. And usually uh, for a dipole antenna with the two arms, it's a half wave dipole, each arm is one quarter wave. And one, one arm is attached to the center conductor here and the other arm is attached to the uh, shield. Okay. Here. Yeah, sorry, that's, I did not do well I'm explaining that, but yeah. Yeah, that's- That's what, what I was wondering. But that, that is what you did though, right? Yeah, that is what I did, yeah. Yeah, with the insulator just, Attach there. So I was soldering them on. There we go. I think Lori has a question. Yeah. Um, hi, Evan. Are you going to be going to Edmonton? I am, yes. <laughs> when did when is that? That is May 13th to 19th. Okay. Uh are you going can you change or improve your project between now and then? I mean, um, um, like, can you do any changing of it from what you have now? I can, I still have yet to make the poster that I think I actually present like on the poster board. Laurie, if you ask for the rules, the answer is absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It was the person who was selected, not the project. Okay. As an okay, antenna, so he, as an so antenna he can, holder, he, I can quite, uh, I can offer you some, some easy ways to uh, make your antenna project or antenna portion easier mm. okay i just just was asking about whether or not and um, you know he can he can kind of add even some of the stuff that he's just doing now right you know like just Absolutely. whether yeah, yeah, that yeah. can be all added in okay thanks good, can I well good luck i hope everything really works well in edmonton but, but, but thank you it doesn't answer what i think is underlying your question Laurie. what are you doing on may 13th um, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I am traveling to Edmonton for the Canada-wide Science Fair. Yeah, with this project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Evan, are you are you um, uh, happy to also kind of uh, to tell the group about other things that happened a couple of days after you won the Science Fair? Sure. Um, so, yeah, uh, back in the uh, a couple months ago, I was busy applying for scholarships as someone in grade 12 usually is. Um, and I was still kind of trying to decide where to go, whether it was going to be UVic or McGill. So I applied for the um, Schulich scholarship, which is like a big kind of candle wide one. And the universities actually offer it. So I first had to apply to the school and the school nominated me yay um and then uh i received an email a couple of weeks ago so yeah just after science fair um it was an offer from uvic for the hundred thousand dollars schulich scholarship so yeah <laughs> i'm going to uvic yeah keep coming to astrocad yeah i won't i won't be leaving so it's good <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, so that's Excellent. been quite the event recently. You, you could be the yeah. chairman of the radio astronomy SIG. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, congratulations. Congratulations, Evan. We, we're so happy that you're going to actually stay around. I was very unhappy when you said that you might actually go off to McGill. Uh, <laughs> no, no, we want you here. So <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Glad to be staying. Well, that is actually a wonderful presentation, uh, and thank you very much. Some very interesting results there. Um, I have to admit, this is uh, something that I'm interested in myself, uh, looking at uh, 
doing meteor observations on the uh, higher frequencies. So it's, it's very good to see uh, uh, that the lower frequencies can be used as well. And uh, it looks like a very um, effective setup that you uh, created there. Uh, and I'm sure that they're, you know, I, I'd be happy to offer any assistance uh, being an amateur operator and there are several other amateur operators who would be probably um, also very happy to offer assistance as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what uh, what you come up with in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Jim, how many ham operators are there active in the club? I know of you and me and- Not me. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking of uh, Chris. Chris, uh, yeah. Uh, I know that uh, I think Malcolm also is uh, licensed, and I know there's at least one other person, but I can't think of who it is. Alex, me, ah, <laughs> yes. Doug, Doug Hardy. <laughs> well, you have uh, you have a wealth of uh, information to draw on there, uh, Evan, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'd be very happy to uh, come up and answer any questions that you might have. So, thank you, Evan. So you don't get singles directly from Jupiter itself. Um, so what do you what do you mean? Radio signals from Jupiter, not from Io, exactly from Jupiter. Yeah, it's yeah from like Jupiter's magnetic field. Okay. Yes. So yeah, caused by Io. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, it sounds like Nathan is uh, not feeling up to making his presentation today. So. Uh... I hope you're feeling better uh, uh, next week, Nathan, or uh, feeling better soon anyway. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing what you've had to uh, present. And uh, I guess then, does anybody else have any um, anything they would like to uh, bring forward? Um, perhaps uh, some observations from our uh, also rare bit of clear skies that we had earlier tonight, earlier this week, and uh, any other observations anyone may have made. Well, we can talk about the weekend. Please. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Very good. I, I, this is what I get when I don't have a written agenda. Lori, uh, tell us uh, how the uh, the weekend went. Well, I, I maybe start off with David because he was he was right smack dab in the middle of it. I just <laughs> actually I just wanted to say first of all, Nathan uh, gave just a fabulous presentation. Uh, yesterday um, at the at the um, uh, at uh, the um, IAD, and I think that that's probably what pulled him over the edge. You know, <laughs> he had to talk. He had to talk um, at uh, yesterday um, in front of lots of people. So um, so uh, I, I'm happy. I'm happy that you were able to do that, Nathan. And uh, we'll get your other project kind of done uh, a little bit later. But you can go ahead and start, David, if you want to. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we were, I don't know, I, it was a lot of work uh, in a very compressed period of time, but it was a lot of fun, and I think it turned out quite well. Uh, we were hopeful for the weather, and actually, believe it or not, it came through, except for Sunday. Yeah. But, you know, we had a lot of fun inside as well. But anyways, I'd like to start off with Saturday. Um, uh, Lori, uh, the people up at the FDAO put on a fabulous show. I mean, um, I didn't get to see the satellite or constellation talk. Did, did you? No, no. Oh, okay. I was I was in the planetarium, so I didn't get to hear it. But it was, it was evidently very good. That's what I heard. Yeah, and it's recorded, anyways. Yes, it it's is. Recorded. Yeah. So everybody should check check that one out. But we had an amazing time out on the deck. Yeah. I know there were people up on the parking lot. I know Dave Payne was out there. Um, a uh, number of people, I think. Uh, ben was, was out there. Hey, Cherry was uh, at the 16th. Jerry. Jennifer. Jennifer. Uh, we had a couple of grad students uh, operating yeah. dogs and the CPC. Yeah. Uh, I was experimenting with my phone so that I could do my talk the next day. <laughs> it turned out I was actually flabbergasted by the capability of the phone. I'm actually so glad um, uh, Laurie asked me to do that because my talk doesn't have, contain any phone stuff. And then she said, well, can you do that? And I said, eh, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah, so I was I was quite uh, having a lot of fun with uh, Sam, who's a grad student. We were sort of comparing results and other people on the deck started doing it as well. 
and we were just shocked that we could see you know full constellations on the phone so it was pretty impressive uh so yeah that, that was great i don't know what happened in the dome brock can you speak about what happened in the dome Sure. Yeah, no, uh, uh, it actually ended up going okay. It was a bit bumpy because I hadn't really planned any sort of targets because I was only supposed to be there for the first two daylight, sort of rotate the dome around. But then Dan, I guess, was sick, so Dan he couldn't sick. make it. Yeah. So I was I s madly scrambling with um, the observer's handbook and my phone trying to quickly put together a couple of targets I could point the telescope at. And I managed to get something at the in the end but uh it was a bit of it might have been a bit messy but i think it came well, together you must have been doing something right because you almost went into overtime well yeah near the end we were getting ahead of steam but it started okay. out a bit slow oh, cool uh, i don't know if there's any other reports from that night but um we were there bright and early the next day uh, uh mm -hmm. on uvic campus uh with the uvic crew and big shout out to sam and karun uh yeah. who plan that that uh that area and all the people that showed up uh the schools and uh the different organizations that uh, it was just really good to see everybody come together again in one place and without masks and without masks yeah, yeah. and we, we were actually chatting a little bit about the nature of the venue because uh, we've always enjoyed like big crowds at the royal bc museum but a lot of people were saying even though the crowds weren't as big it was a targeted crowd. There were people that really wanted yes. to be. So mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, Margie, can you give us a report from the welcome desk? Oh, we had lots of people come to the welcome desk. Um, Bill Weir donated some uh, wonderful books. Um, and we put them at, we, we had a couch behind us. So we put them on the couch and we invited uh, as we as we um, as we talked to the there are now um, there were three schools uh, represented there who have which have um, uh, astronomy clubs so Vic High was there um, Shawnigan Lake was there and uh, Monterey Middle School has just two weeks ago started an astronomy club wow. so we offered books we offered Bill's books to um the three astronomy clubs and we had them come and pick a couple each and then um monterey got the they, they got a really good deal because we had we had about six books left and they took them all and they took a huge pile of um magazines so we got rid of a lot of those too <laughs> so, yeah so we had to, it was it was it was it was uh, quieter, it was certainly quieter than at the museum, but um, we gave away numerous uh, star finders, and um, um, it it was it was all good. Oh, Would you say, Margie, that we like a hundred people, a hundred and fifty people? Like, can you give any uh, or can other people kind of do a little bit of a indication? I was thinking about a hundred. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like we didn't quite advertise well enough. <laughs> I think it was the plate. I mean, we did produce a poster very early, like April 15th. But I think uh, the problem was the distribution of it. And we probably didn't hit social media as rapidly as we should have. And did we get into the Times Colonist or anything? No, no. No, we got there. Um, no. I, I know that Chris had arranged for a talk with Madeline Marshall on CFAX, I think. I'm oh, not quite sure. I agree uh, on CFAX. So it did air then. Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. And Bob McDonald um, did mention it um, in his little his, his little talk on CBC um, on Friday morning. No, uh, Chris put it out to some of the media, like our, our regular kind of media things that go out to various things and only and only one one of the media outlets picked it up so um that it's it's a bit unusual because usually we get two or three um at least in in different places but so i i guess maybe i'm going to go back to a couple of weeks ago when i said hey everybody out there 
in in RASC land. We need some people to help with so with with the media um yeah. so media good. involvement and i i mean chris chris picked it up right away which was great and malcolm um helped in distributing some some uh posters uh, but we didn't you know we we need we honestly need a team we need a team of people who are going to be really like that that's going to be the job um once we get all the the stuff ready we need people to be putting it out on instagram and 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 Facebook and and really kind of pulling it up and trying and like going to CBC and saying hi we'd like to do a promo could you could you get somebody to do that you know I mean I think it just take but uh, David and I just didn't have the time at the at the uh, end to kind of go racing around and try to find to do all that and and so I think we were definitely down the numbers uh, but um, but in the end, I mean, I, I just am so thankful for everybody that came out. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a group of people that were all that were all so involved. And and there's just no way that we can say thank you enough to everybody that did come out and, and helped beforehand, uh, helped during, helped after and, uh, you know, and did and did some some behind the scenes work. And um, and again, to the people at UVic. Um, who were were incredibly helpful. Sam Sam Felder was just amazing, and Karun, even with his hand completely bounded up after his surgery, was uh, you know was 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 tapping out things in his with his left hand rather than his right with uh, with things to get out. And I I I sent I or I I gave a bouquet of flowers to Susan Nucci today at the university, who was the person behind, who every time we wanted anything, we would say, Susan, could you get this for us? And it just kind of appeared. And so I went and sent, I went and sent flowers um, to her today, uh, cause I thought she really deserved uh, something kind of in the back end there. Um, anyway, uh, just thank you to everybody that uh, had anything to do um, with this. Um, you're all to be really uh, commended and people who were not able to be there like Joe, um, you know, or Randy, <laughs> we missed you. We really did, and uh, and we hope that you'll be that we'll get something back. I think we need to do. We have we have to have a decision, or I mean, a discussion about venue and about what to do. Because in fact, this would be the time right now is to kind of. Um, I mean, not like please, not tomorrow, but um, but you know, soon is that we decide. Um, what we would do a, another year for astronomy day what could make it better um uh, you know things that we learned things that uh, could uh, could be could be changed um with the the different um presentations the presentations were terrific and i know some of i saw some people in there but i also saw that not a lot of i mean not a lot of you were able to get into the presentations and and so that's something that we need to kind of figure out is how to get people in and out of there when things are being done we want to change up a little bit of the timing of that um another year um we would take any and everybody's um uh uh you know, kind of interest in what was going on, give ideas, give suggestions for anything else that, that we could do. Well, we're just happy to take everybody's um, uh, everybody's um, information. Margie, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think that's a lo lovely idea to get people together um, uh, relatively soon and talk about what what could be what could be um, added to, improved upon for. Hmm. Um, and um, my other comment was that we had more teenage kids there yes. this year than I have ever seen, okay. and um, it was it was it was just wonderful. The 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 young people from um, Vic High, from Shawnigan Lake, and um, uh, kind of a little cohort from um, Monterey Middle School just kind of walked around together. <laughs> there was about six of them. And they'd gone to do something in the morning, and then they they all went to lunch together, and then they came over to the to UVic, uh, and uh, they just kind of stuck together like glue. Uh, and they had their vice principal with them, who apparently is the um, uh, uh, he was instrumental in in founding that that uh, astronomy club. So the the number of um, young teenagers uh, from anywhere from thirteen onwards was just. It would just added a liveliness to the mm -hmm. to the, mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to, the mm -hmm. to the day. Actually, before we leave the before we leave the topic, I 
I see a lot of faces here, which we really need to hear from. Um, I can see um, uh, Bill Weir there. Bill, can you give us a quick report? Oh, Dorothy, oh Dor sorry, Dorothy, go ahead, Dorothy. Dorothy had her hand up. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, unmute. I think it's an excellent venue. I think it's better than the museum, actually, because it it get well, it gets more students. It gets people who are interested in it. And I think this year part of the problem, which may often happen at the time of year, but there were other things going on on Sunday, which there aren't usually. I think in previous years, there's many other things going on: music, the run, some other things. So. That, along with advertising, may account for the lower numbers. But there were wonderful visitors. First mm -hmm. one, I was really happy, really happy to have come up and look at the, the responsible lighting, electromagnetic spectrum display. And say, I've been writing to Senate Council about the awful lights for years. This is out of the blue. I didn't have to say anything or tell her what was going on. And this is a very important year for Saanich, uh, for us to get to Saanich because they're working on their five-year plan or will be. And to have someone from the public who had come in, I mean, so she'd obviously known about it from someplace, like, had come in and was going around everything. And then to let us know that she was active in this. I should have asked her name and gotten her to join the club. The, uh, and, uh, we, there also are international students and coming through. And I uh, had a recommendation from some Spanish graduate students. They are Spanish now graduate students at uh, Geneva and the UK, but suggesting that we instigate um, hour or of darkness, maybe on Earth Day or some other time, which is something that was done in Spain. Spain is the darkest country in Europe, apparently, and it's been recognized as really reduced outdoor lighting. So I think the UVic um, setting offers the possibility of having a very in, uh, audience or people coming through participating um, and not as many of the, the tourists, nothing against the tourists, <laughs> you understand, but the reams of people coming through the museum who didn't really know what they were doing when they came through, that's, that's my two cents. I think it's a very, it's a very nice, open, bright, uh, attractive setting. And of course, we, we can't be at the museum for I don't know how many years yet anyway, so. But good setting. So I agree, Laurie. Yeah. Okay. Dorothy. Thank you, Dorothy. Yeah. Uh, Bill, Bill, do you want to tell us about your show and tell? And... It, it was a lot of fun. It always is. I enjoy people just come by. Um, I'm kind of counter to Dorothy on the venue because at this time of year, you fix like a dead zone. Everybody's left. I don't know, if we want to hit a lot of people, we need to get in the path of people going by. I'm not worried about whether they're tourists or not, but if it was local, you know, I expressed an opinion on where I thought might be a good place, like one of the libraries, but um, where there's lots of people going by and all that, but um, the telescope show and tell and the um, up on the hill the night before, that was just a lot of fun to be up there. It would have been nice to have seen more members up there with their telescopes. I mean, Saturday nights used to be a real party of RESC people, but, you know. Well, yeah. we invite anybody uh, or invite oh, everybody I, to come oh, up. I, know. <laughs> I don't yeah. think there was much hosting around you, Dick, that this is actually going on. That's happened before, too, which is part of the problem of getting the word out ahead of time so people know. Um, we would have to, if we did it at UVic again and didn't do it in the dead zone of the end of April or 1st of May, that it would almost have to be done about the middle of March because 
they, the students are right in the middle of exams and things like that in April. And, um, you know, so if we did something middle of April, they, they still wouldn't be able to really do an awful lot with us because uh, they'd be preparing for exams. So I don't, I mean, it could be maybe the 1st of April or something like that, that we, I mean, if we wanted to, I mean, to me, the International Astronomy Day is a day and we've changed it up several times in our, in our thing, depending on when we could get a venue. So it's not as though we absolutely have to have anything on exactly the, the day we can move around a little bit. So anyway, it's just, I think it's just really worth, um, worth a, a discussion. So to, what, as what about, to what to do with that. About discussing the idea of switching to the alternate astronomy day, which I think is in the fall. Don't they have two, two per yes. year? Yes. They might, yeah. Yeah, that's not a yeah. bad idea. And I, I thought we don't necessarily even have to do it on an astronomy day. We can just have an astronomy community day of our choosing whenever we want to do it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, Brock, yeah. Brock you, you have your hand up. Yeah, no, I was just uh, reiterating what Lori said. My daughter's at, at UVic and she had just finished her final exams and she doesn't start classes for another week. And, you know, I would imagine pretty much all university students about a week ago went home to hang out with their parents and get free yeah. food and won't be back on campus for another week. So it, it literally is a ghost town for the week that we were there. And uh, it, yeah. it felt like it. How was the astro photo area? Did you get any visitors? We got some visitors for sure. But I mean, you know, I think from the point of view of timing on campus, the location may, you know, two weeks earlier, two weeks, well, I think two weeks later would be better because then you'd have students that haven't really gotten into the heat of anything really heavy yet and that have time to just kind of wander around and they're not all stressed out by exams. If that was the location we yeah. wanted. So I want to hear from Jill, actually. Jill, Jill, we left up in the observatory area, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the tours that went on and, and what you did. I don't know anything about the tours. A lot of people came through. They came, I was kind of, I, I got them as they came through to look at the solarium stuff. So I guess I saw more people than if I'd been in a room and they had to find me because everybody found me. So uh, it was okay. Um, it was a little lonely up there at times. Uh, How many students were up there with you? I had no. Well, there were there were three students in the observ in the observatory, yeah. on and off. And uh, there was nobody with me except for if they wanted if some of them sat in and listened and asked questions. It's interesting. So, Did you get people stopping by and sitting and and chatting with you? Oh yeah, I got I I. I thought there were about 80 people I talked to. About 80? 80, wow. yeah. But yeah. That was just, that's just kind of a loose estimate, but I started by counting them because there were so few at the beginning. But then yeah. a whole bunch of people around noon-ish came and there were like 20 of them. And I, you know, it was, it was almost lecture format for a while. Yeah. Because <laughs> there were so many people. Well, yeah. we were, yeah. we were, um, so, so that's interesting because we were, thinking that you would be down like just down like right close by and then we had to switch uh, almost on a dime on the friday like to to change the event change where you were so um so but maybe you're saying you're right by by being up there but we but you you uh, suffered from not being around like the rest of us or jill uh, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> on her own yeah but so it's so it's an idea i got more people i think and everybody thought I was connected to UVic, and they all we, they were calling me professor and stuff. They were there. <laughs> <laughs> there, oh, we really? just we've just promoted you, Jill. No problem at all. Both so. played along, Jill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Careful. Anybody work. else I'm have uh, Chris? Uh, sorry, I was just going to say, Chris Gaynor, thank you. You took pictures. You were there in the auditorium taking pictures of all the speakers. Thank you so much for doing that. And for, you know, for setting us up, you're always, you always just kind of just um, uh, end up doing that for us. And, and it's just, it's wonderful. We really appreciate Chris, it. Chris, Chris, I think you have some pictures up on Zenfolio as well. Muted. Uh, yeah. You're muted, Chris. Michael wanted to. Sorry, ask. what did you say? I said, you have some of your photos up on Zenfolio. 
Yes, I, I, I threw them up. I didn't have time to put captions on them, but uh, uh, yeah. Okay. But thank, yeah, just thank you for thank you for doing that part because that's always that's always really kind of fun to see what uh, to see what happened. Yeah. yeah. And Mike, Michael wanted to say something. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Michael. I was just gonna say that uh, don't underestimate what it does for the RASC uh, group because. Uh, to my surprise, I found out that some of you have spouses or partners. Some of you are taller than I thought. Some of you are wider than I thought. Uh, it was uh, a social event. It was a social event. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, some of you are even friendlier than I imagined. So. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, well, I close uh, I think maybe we should just stop it right there. <laughs> so before you before you do, can I say uh, three things? One, I, I'd like to thank uh, Lori for being a wonderful person to uh, to uh, during all of the talks. She was a great MC wow. and and uh, did a really lovely job there. I want to. I want to give a shout out for Nathan because when Nathan gave his very entertaining and interesting talk, mm -hmm. a whole pile of young people came in there. And at the end, during the question and answer, they asked him why, how he got involved in astronomy. Uh -huh. And he gave a very skillful plug for the RASC <laughs> and encouraged us, uh, the kids to join. Him. That was wonderful. It wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, we and, didn't pay him or anything. No, I know. Yeah. And David Lee gave a talk on making astrophotography easy. And he just discovered the uh, uh, tremendous capabilities of his new iPhone and new software for it. So next year, I think he's going to give a talk called Astrophotography on a Galloping Horse. And, and he'll be <laughs> brilliantly with that. So. <laughs> No, it was lovely. We had uh, John McDonald. I don't think John is on tonight. John gave, I mean, he's just, he is just such a, uh, uh, a fluid and uh, competent speaker that he just, it just kind of flows out of him uh, beautifully that he gave a talk on, on the summer sky. And it was, it was just, it was kind of exactly what we needed because we had been, um, you know, some of the people had been uh, talking about things from the James Webb and were, you know, billions of you know light years away and that kind of thing and then to kind of come all come back to to just well this is what we can see you know with just by being outside in the summer sky and then David followed up by well this is what you can do to actually do the photography and uh you know so it was really it it was really a very nice mix of people and um and I was happy to um to be able to pull pull all those um all those people together thank you to um to uh Karun who was the who basically kind of put out and said hey anybody anybody want to talk and everybody just simply um said sure and uh and it and it worked out really well so thank you all right um so we'll maybe what we can do um uh is uh talk a little bit more about it at our next council meeting but i would also like to pull it out that if anybody's got ideas um uh, like margie did this morning at 7 42 she was already online just uh, chatting away about things that we could do um uh, but anybody's got any ideas just like throw them out to either randy or to david or i or like any of these people on the on the board um that uh, we can get we can get we can compile some things together and maybe make some decisions um a little bit sooner than than this year so, okay Sorry, Thanks, that is very good to Mention the council meeting, which will be on Tuesday the 9th on Zoom. I, I know that announcement went out to the council members, but um, I'll make sure that it gets sent out on all of Sky News tonight so that we have more than our week uh, required announcement. Everybody is welcome to council meetings. It's always been the case, but we haven't been very good at advertising them before. And uh, certainly the International Astronomy Weekend 
will be um, one of the items on the agenda. Um, another thing that uh, I want to bring up will be Bill, but Chris, are you talking about the council meeting or something uh, else? Yes, I just wanted to make sure you were aware I sent you the link for it tonight. Very good. I will send as the Sky News the link to everybody. Very good. Uh, because I don't think Ken is on the line. No, I don't see him. So I'll do that. Now, um, another big thing happening this month, which we had said we don't have a volunteer base to do. And then wonderful Bill Weir says, this doesn't feel right. So Bill, why don't you take it from there? Yes, so I guess we'll find out if there is a volunteer base. <laughs> so at, on May 27th, it's something that we've done for, I will not say decades, but close to that. And it's usually been Sid organizing it. There's a, the, the, the youngest scouting group called Beavers. Every year they have a gathering out at Camp Bernard out on Young Lake Road, just out in Souk. Um, it's just really a few hours of your time on that day of going there. And um, there'll be lots of other community groups there, but um, we've always sort of set up sort of like a little welcome table type thing and really solar telescopes and groups of kids will come by. We'll get more visitors than astronomy day. Um, it'll probably be a hundred, couple hundred kids will come by over, in little groups, so they won't show up as one giant line. Although one time out there when I was there staying overnight, a thing I had probably a lineup of a couple hundred kids at one telescope, and um, it's actually a lot of fun. I could probably gather personally four or five telescopes to be able to use. So you wouldn't even need to have a solar rig. I mean, we, I could gather up enough and one of them would be like a 90 millimeter Coronado that Pearson has that they said I could use. And there's a Quest Star with a H Alpha. I have a little PST and I've got some white light stuff. So we could do it with just what I have. Or if you have something I want to show, I'm looking for maybe half a dozen people to come out there. I'm trying to think of what time it starts. 9 30 in the morning and it would be done in the early afternoon it would be done by about two o'clock in the afternoon and um it's a lot of fun so um you, so get in you, touch with you or uh i mean certainly if you get in touch with president at victoria.rast.ca i will put them out to you but um as you said, this is a really excellent outreach event. If we can grab them when they're, what, seven? And their parents will be there. there. There's a lot of adults that are being there. You're not going to be expected to be corralling in kids. The adults are there involved with it that will be doing that. You're just putting an eyeball to an eyepiece. And it's they're usually, well reasonably well behaved. <laughs> I, I've, like I said, I had a lineup of 200 kids at one telescope and it took one bark at them saying, if I see anybody pushing, you're going to the end of the line. And they just, <laughs> no, they snapped too. And I never had to put one kid at the back of the line and they waited their turn and we all looked at Saturn and it was a blast. So they usually can behave quite well. And we'll just hope for some. Margie? I was just wondering, what about the idea of just putting that information into um, um, it, kind of like an, I don't know, in CFUW, we do e-blast. So um, just to all, the, to all the membership, just the information, uh, what, uh, what the day is, um, yeah the time and um, uh, just let people ask people to let you know if they would like to volunteer because I would. 
Yeah, I, w- I was going to do that. I was waiting until Astronomy Day was over before I mentioned it. I just didn't want to <laughs> make people think of too many things. But it's a good time now to think about it because Astronomy Day was a lot of fun. And you know, more people, less work. I'm going and, by myself. If you, don't have, if you don't have six people, is it still feasible? Oh, I'll go by myself. If nobody ever says anything, I'm still going there. I told Kim I'd be there. So I, one, one, I'd do it what I could. I'd still show our face. Lori has a problem. Lori. Hi there, um, uh, Bill. I can probably come up for for the morning, so I you can throw me out, and I'll bring some stuff that shows how far apart um, things are on the field, uh, planets are on the field. Okay, so I can do that. Um, but I did want to. I did want to. If if we're finished with that, there is one other thing that is happening, um, very important. Uh, this coming weekend. Is it time to talk about that or? Oh, the Later. GA. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the General Assembly is this weekend, starting on Friday. Um, and uh, because we are three hours ahead of the East, um, then uh, our, the things will start around um, four o'clock or so in the afternoon on Friday and uh, be finished um, you know, a little bit earlier than everybody out East. Um, so Friday uh, is a um, uh, 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 Corey Gray is going, uh, sorry, sorry, um, sorry, a wrong person. Oh dear. I've just, I've just lost the person who's going to be speaking, who is our main speaker. Oh, I'll, I'll get back to it um, on Friday. And then on Saturday, we have a um, full complement of um, uh, people who are going to be speaking during the, uh, during the day. Again, our, the programs will start in the morning and then be finished kind of a little bit earlier. Uh, we have, um, uh, uh, different um, different programs that are going to be all during the day, and then we have a plenary session, uh, uh, which means like it's so it's everybody is invited to kind of more uh, a, a talk on um, on science uh, on kind of science misinformation and and how we combat that, um, and we've got uh, Andrew Fizikis is going to be in on that. Um, we have got a couple of other, uh, John Percy uh, from Toronto. We've got a couple of very, really good people that are going to be on the panel with that. And then in the evening or uh, late afternoon for us, we have, um, oh, thank you, Shandon Pete. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah. Jeremy Hansen is going to be speaking to us on Saturday night. Um, and uh, of course, he's going to be the, the Canadian going up in the, um, in the Artemis II. Uh, and then on Sunday we're having um, we're having um, uh, people speaking, and in fact we've got Nathan and Randy are going to be in on the programs on Sunday if you'd like to come and listen to them. Um, and then Linda Shore, who is the um, who is the uh, uh, executive kind of director person at the um, uh, astronomical astronomical society of the Pacific. So that's kind of our the uh, a very large organization um, there that is going to be speaking. So there's lots and lots to come and see, uh, a come and or come and listen to. Uh, the uh, RAC members are thirty five dollars um, for the three days, and um, and I'm uh, and if on honestly, if anybody is having difficulty with that uh, amount of money, um, and they don't feel as though they can come because of that, please uh, let me know. And we can make sure that we can that we can um, get uh, get you there. Um, just no problems whatsoever. I don't want I don't want money to be any part of a problem of this whatsoever. So just let me know, and we can uh, we can make sure sh- make sure that that works. Um, so the one thing though that I really really need is that um, on the Friday afternoon, Friday kind of Friday um, evening, um, be- uh, after our main speaker um, Shandon Pete. Um, it's going to be us that is going to be in in the limelight so that we are going to be um, streamed live across Canada 
um, for the up at the up at the center of the universe and the DAO. Um, uh, so we're going to be putting on a one hour of, or like between 50 minutes and one hour program um, that is going to be um, that is going to be um, there. And um, what we're going to be doing is a, um, a tour, a live tour of the of the telescope, doing a little bit of some history, uh, showing what was going on. Um, uh, and I'm even going to see if I can even get into the uh, to the other um, the other smaller telescope on the hill. I haven't asked for that, but I, I'm hoping that we will. Um, and then uh, we want to show some of the pictures that the Plasket takes. Um, Dan Posey, of course, has been taking these for a number of years, and some of them are just glorious. And uh, and we want to we want to make sure that people see that it's not just other telescopes that takes gorgeous pictures that our Plaskett does as well. And then we'll come in um, to show a little bit of what's happening in the, in the gallery. But I'd also like to have um, some people show off some of the other things that we do. So for instance, I would, I would love to be able to open up the 16 inch to show people uh, to show people that maybe put that lovely 20 inch or the Celestron 11 out on the, out on the deck. And if it's really gorgeous, because we're between seven and eight, well, actually, there may be even a chance if it's sunny that we'll be able to show uh, to show some of our uh, some of the the sun the sun on that time as well. Very a very kind of not not a very long period of time, but I would I would really appreciate about I, I mean I'm thinking maybe um, at least five or six people that can come out to help me with this. Um, I've got a I've kind of set up a little bit of a of a storyline for it as to what we're going to do. And, um, and I'd love people to be involved um, in this. Um, this is going to be, as I said, um, I, all the participants are going to be able to get a chance to listen to us and to ask questions. Um, it will be in a, um, it will be in a, a meeting format, I believe, although I'm going to have to check that one out a little bit because of the streaming. Um, but, um, but we would really need to I really need your help with this one. And if I can get some people to help out, that would be fabulous. So I need a couple of people to help in the dome and a, a few people to put out some telescopes on the deck is what I'm, I'm really asking for. So if you're available on that fr on Friday, uh, Friday, then that would be, uh, that would be great. Uh, we can also have, uh, because we'll be up there beforehand getting ready, we can have Shandon Pete um, being streamed live um, up on on the um, in the auditorium, so that if anybody would like to listen to uh, Shand and Pete while we are just kind of getting ourselves organized uh, for for after the talk, um, that can be that can be done. Any questions by anybody? I just wanted to say, Peter Jedeke, if you're still on there, Peter, you did a wonderful job showing off London um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago how many years ago now three or four um it, that when you we did the same kind of thing that we're going to try to do so it was it was only just last year Lori. uh what 20, 20, 2022 <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, i thought it was and, before that and okay. if, if you don't mind me taking a moment to uh yes to, toot the horn the uh, video is available on the RSC london center youtube page and so we can go and have a look and see. You can. Yeah. And, and in fact, I would beg you all to subscribe to the RAC London Center YouTube page. We only have 38 subscribers and there's some kind of a benefit that you get if you have 100 yeah. subscribers. It doesn't cost you anything. Just click subscribe. And when we get to 100, we get something special. And you don't even have to watch any of the videos. Just subscribe. <laughs> no, and, I mean and, and while I've got your ear, um, yeah. I wanted to ask you how how are we connecting for the GA? Is it a Zoom call? I haven't. Yes, received... it will be a Zoom. It will be a Zoom call. Yes. So I haven't yeah. received any contact connection information. Is are they? Uh, that's all coming out. Or? That's all coming out this week when it will all be uh, confirmed and all of the different sessions will all have their Zoom links and and uh, and everybody everybody that is that is. Um, uh, has already got their tickets. We'll all get that information completely. And uh, then if people are signing on and getting tickets, you can get tickets right up to Friday afternoon 
Um, and uh, and the links will just be automatically given to you if so if you do sign up on the on the on, on even on the Friday. But we'd love to have the numbers um, the numbers up uh, for um, for the for the GA. Obviously, more people that come, then uh, we'll be uh, we'll we won't be in the red <laughs> uh, for that. Um, so we hope to we hope to be able to have that. If everybody could just come on, even for just a little while, come and listen to Nathan and to uh, and to uh, Randy and some of the other um, people that you uh, you will know. Randy Atwood is speaking, um, and we're having a uh, uh, Alan Dyer is going to be doing a tribute um uh to um terence dickinson which will be really quite heartfelt and and really uh, very nicely done as well um, so so thank you thank you peter I'll, I'll 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 contact you if we need to have some some help for what we need to do for this coming friday well thank you laurie thank you and, okay and look forward to seeing you there yeah thank you okay all right thanks everybody and I'd like to push the social aspect of that GA too. Oh yeah. There yeah. is that little virtual world that you can go and meet a lot of the people that you could go talk to Peter because I have seen him there and people are just Gather standing time. around and you walk up to them and just start chatting because it'd be just like you were at a convention. Only you can find out yeah. what they're really like. <laughs> yeah well no it's just not a face it is still a face on the screen but it's more it really it actually works i was yeah. quite surprised yeah, it's how really well quite it fun. works and we have poster sessions and we have astrophotography um uh the astrophotography um contest is on i know that bill weir has got something in there that he's put in there because i've seen the i've seen the the list and uh so uh, good luck bill don't know i i'm not involved in the in the contest at all but uh, uh good luck on that and um uh yeah gather town is really quite fun and it, it just takes a it just takes like maybe 30 seconds to kind of get yourself in on it at the at the end you'll be given all the links for it so it's not a problem all right i'm going to stop now well did anybody else have uh, anything they would like to add to the uh anything for show and tell pictures or observations or uh, anything else oh marjorie yes I don't know who that was. Um, just, uh, just FYI, I uh, clicked on Astronomy by Night, which is the replacement thing for Sky News uh, on YouTube. And it says it has one subscriber and <laughs> two videos. Uh, and I subscribe, so I don't know if I'm the one or the second, but uh, if we did want to support that young lady um, in uh, her endeavor, maybe a couple of clicks would help. Oh, very good. Yes, I have the uh, the website marked, but I didn't realize I had a YouTube channel. Very good. Anyway, sorry, Marjorie, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you had something. Okay. Um, you might you might want to and I put me on a big screen because this is kind of small. Um, mm -hmm. We have had a few nights where I could see the moon, and um, you may recall that I am doing the. Um, uh, uh, expand the universe. No, what's it called? And that thing. Explore the universe. Explore the universe. Look at the front of my book. Explore the universe. So um, I have been taking, because I could see the moon from my balcony, I've been taking advantage of, of um, being able to draw some craters. So uh, you have to have six out of the 12 craters. I now have eight, mm. and I'm going to have a couple more. Craters have kind of, um, they've, they've become my recent thing. <laughs> And once I realized that I could actually see them with by 10 with 10 by 42 binoculars, you actually can on a tripod. So um, I'm going to show you this. So here is, um, let's see, second one down. This is Ptolemaeus. Oh, that's nice. Good. Can somebody uh, highlight uh, uh, Margie? Uh, spotlight. Spotlight. There we go. Or spotlight. Yeah, oh, there we go. There's Ptolemaeus. Nice. That's fantastic. And here is Copernicus. Hmm. 
Okay, nice nice so job. that's with the uh, the the lines are kind of where you get the um, highlands yeah. going to the ocean, I guess. Yeah, they're mare. Right. Yeah. So I'm having fun with this. That that's is it. so good. All right. Well, Thanks, Margie. Fun. You're ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> that's her. Um... Only, only in drawing, Laurie. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Very, very nicely done, Marjorie. Do we have anything else that uh, people would like to uh, bring up? Bill, can you tell us about next week's speaker? Justin? Yeah. Oh, I've, I've never met Justin. I was just hooked up with him through Levante, who is one of the section people form so it's about um i can't remember his last name uh he's the main in, um prophet uvic who's involved with the cubesat that uvic sent up on the space shuttle that's about sort of i believe it's kind of the idea of creating an artificial star using a satellite for people to to judge seeing and for telescopes. So instead of having to use lasers to create artificial stars, using CubeSats that are up there. And um, right now it's up and going around. So I don't know if he's gonna be able to tell us everything that's going on, but he will be talking about the project and how it was created and the team and all that. And so it, it was a successful deployment and it's going around. I learned about it last summer when I ran into a former student from Pearson who was talking about this satellite, that this CubeSat that he was involved with building. And then um, one morning listening to CBC radio, I heard that it was going up on one of the- on Justin one Albert. Of the, yes, Justin Albert. Yes, and it was and going up- OrcaSat. Yeah, OrcaSat. And I thought, oh, maybe that's Levante's thing. And so knowing a name now, I could look it up. And it was like, yeah. And so once I knew that it was up there and going, I contacted Levante and he passed me on to Justin. And so I, I asked him if he would do a talk, but I was, he said, can it wait till after school's over? And so when it was over, I contacted him and then passed him on to Randy to sort out the final details. So. I think he's going to give us about a, what did I see, a 45 minute chat with time for questions and all that about how it's working. So it should be interesting. It's a local project that's up there going around right now. Went up on one of the SpaceX rockets. We can say uh, Elon Musk is doing something good for us. Yeah, the crew all went down there to watch it and then it got scrubbed, the actual launch. They got to watch something else get launched and then they came back and then a few days later, it went up. Ah. <laughs> so they got to watch something go up, but not theirs. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Thank you, uh, Bill. That's uh, interesting local connection. Do we have anything else? Does anybody, would anybody else like to uh, bring something up? Oh, just just one thing. Uh, uh, do I, uh, I, uh, I, I signed up for the uh, uh, the London Center YouTube, and uh, I came came across this. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if anybody recognizes that fellow. <laughs> I recognize the chin. <laughs> if you want to see something funnier, I, I should find a picture of me from that from that time. But uh, anyway, Chris, you'll have to tell me who it is because I don't know. Oh, it's that, that's Peter Jedicky. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. In 1981. <laughs> Uh, 
That's hilarious. <laughs> That's food to use. Yeah. Let's not go there. <laughs> Notice that Peter is not responding at all. I disappear. <laughs> well, I believe that's just about everything then. Uh, we're coming up to, uh, we're coming close to 8.45. So uh, unless anybody else has uh, something they would like to bring up, uh, perhaps we can call it, uh, bring it to a close and uh, look forward to uh, seeing everybody uh, next week. Do we have any final thinkers here? So many people and nobody wants to talk. Oh, Bill is waving her hands. Yeah, I just wondered, uh, David, is there a, a beginner to think tomorrow night? I was just thinking, yikes, I guess I better put an announcement out. <laughs> <laughs> I won't let it get. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. And uh, Jill, are you, are you sort of uh, doing your first What's Up in the Sky? Yep. Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah, uh, if you haven't joined the uh, getting started in astronomy sig uh please join and join us and you can hear jill tell us about what's up in the sky and we'll do other things as well all right see you online at the ga <laughs> good night Bye. Bye. Yeah, good night everybody thank you for coming thank good you. night <laughs>